time. Uh, Dave Kravitz with Danny Mindo, my co-chair. We are buddies. We have a great time doing this. We actually have a ball doing this. Uh, we'll be hosting tonight. Um, we're going to mute everybody very soon. Then we'll be unmuting to take questions from chat. If you're enjoying our webinars, please validate your support with a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. I'll put that link on chat. Click on in honor of and then select affinity groups or webinars. So now I'm going to introduce Michael Barkian, our speaker. Michael Barkian is host for NBC Sports Philadelphia. Michael is a graduate of Syracuse University with a BS in broadcast journalism from the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. Michael was a sports reporter for KW, KYW TV in Philadelphia and then became sports director for WLVI TV in Boston. He returned to Philadelphia to be host of NBC Sports Philadelphia. Michael has hosted Eagles Post Game Live. Michael hosts Post Game Live programs for the Phillies, Flyers, and Sixes whenever the team is in or near the playoffs. Michael has served as field reporter for the USA Network's coverage of the U.S. Open Tennis Championships. His career has involved the NCAA. He has covered the Final Four and Fiesta Bowl for CBS, as well as Big Five basketball events and telecasts. Michael's career also has included reporting for CBS. With CBS, he has covered major events, including the Olympic Winter Games. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you, Michael Barkham. David, thank you very much. David uh, ad lib that whole thing, which was wonderful. Um, but wait, so, so you, hey, Michael, all... Michael, before you start, I just, I just want to, uh, I just want to tell. So everyone, please, 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 make sure you are on mute. It is someone's not, and I can't find who it is. So please look at your I little button, him. and you got him. Rick got them. Okay, and just to clarify one more, so Michael's going to speak to us. He's going to do a presentation. Any questions you might have, you can ask through the chat, and then I'll either feed him to the questions to him, or you can take them directly, and uh, we'll take it from there. So please keep yourself muted also. Thanks. Oh, you didn't mean for me to mute. Um, okay, just want to make sure. David, just want to make you feel at home, buddy. There yeah, we go. thanks. There you go, David, from 2018. All right. That's right. Hey. I left Boston and, the, and then the Red Sox and the Patriots and the Celtics and the Bruins. They want everything in sight. I needed a thank you note, for goodness sakes, and get out of town. <laughs> um, my name is Michael Barkan. Thank you very much for inviting me. These are all you're all conservative Jews. Are you, I'm a reform. I'm, I'm a reform Jew. And my synagogue has a Yom Kippur brunch. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I thought you closed for the holiday. I'm here, I'm here all night. Try the deal. <laughs> No, it's not par. Don't try to veal. Anyway, um, but thank you for inviting me. I'm a Jersey boy. I was uh, I was born and raised. I'm supposed to tell everybody about my life, right, David? Just yes, want to make sure. Correct. Okay, you're not muted, David. You were supposed to sign that. Okay, you signed that to me. Yeah. Okay. I'm kidding. Um, anyway, I was born in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. I grew up in East Brunswick, New Jersey. And um, like many of you, all I ever wanted to do was be a professional athlete. That's what we all want to do. And I realized uh, fairly quickly in my life that uh, although I had a decent jump shot and a decent slap shot and a decent uh, arm, I wasn't even going to come close to, to making it as a professional athlete. So I thought I still don't want to work for a living. So how can I, you know, how can I do that? And I thought, well, I love sports. I'll try to stay in sports and make my living that way. So as David mentioned, I went to Syracuse University and I majored in broadcast journalism there. And um, both my parents went to Syracuse. I went to Syracuse and, and my daughter, Emily, graduated from Syracuse a couple of years ago. So it's, a, it's orange runs in our veins, I guess you could say. And um, she actually majored the same exact major as, as me, which was, which was really uh, cool uh, as a dad. And um, I... Uh, I applied to the School of Broadcast Journalism and uh, SI Newhouse School of Public Communications, and I was denied entry, even with that kind of background and pedigree. And uh, so I had to work real hard. They admitted me into arts and sciences. I had to work real hard to get my grades up and transfer into uh, the School of Public Communications, which I did first semester. Also helped that I ran cross country 
which is a real sport. It's not a sissy sport like hockey or football. I mean, it's a dangerous sport where you can. Yes, you know that. Uh, is that Neil? No, that's not Neil. Um, he's, he's giving me a high sign. You know, cross country is a tough sport. Turn your ankle on a twig or something in the woods. It's, it's tough. So because I ran cross country at Syracuse, um, I got to register for my classes early. And uh, so I got all the classes I needed to transfer into new house. I got good grades for that one semester. I transferred into new house, second semester, freshman year. And then I spent the rest of my college career on academic probation. I wish I was joking, but I'm not joking. It's the truth. My wife found my report cards while we were dating and she started pulling them out. It's just unbelievable. And then my daughter found them, which was even worse. So, but I managed to make it through and, um, Went down to Washington, D.C. and got a job at NBC News in Washington. And as I said, I always wanted to be a, a, a sportscaster. But I thought for a time there, you know what? Sports is just a lark. Sports is just frivolous. I mean, you know, news is where it's at. News affects the world. So when I went down to D.C., I was working in the uh, Washington Bureau of NBC News, 4001 Nebraska Avenue. And... Um, I was stuffing mailboxes with the New York Times and the Washington Post, and I was ripping wire copy. Kids today, they don't know what wire copy is. I was ripping wire copy off the, off the wire machine, and I thought, I'll become the first desk assistant to work his way up and in, into, into an anchor job or a national correspondent. So I did that for a summer, and I realized that that was not going to happen. So I moved back home, back to Central Jersey, to East Brunswick, and I got a job at New Jersey Network uh, and in the newscast that they ran called New Jersey Network News. And, um, and I, I, um, I was doing the same thing really as I was in DC, except I, I could do more stuff. In Washington, all I was doing was ripping the wire copy and stuff in the mailboxes. But when I was at New Jersey Network, I could go out with a camera crew, I could do interviews, I wasn't on the air, but I was like, I was doing different things and it was great. And I would go home and, and New Jersey Network was seen at Channel 13 in New York and four UHF stations around New Jersey outside of Philadelphia. So it was it, it was a nice start for me. I was all of, what, 22 years old. And um, and one of the jobs that they had me do was to write the weather. I would write, we didn't have a, a weatherman or a weather woman in the uh, newscast. And I would write the weather report for the anchors to read. So uh, one day, and I would always come to work. You know, they say dress for the job you want. So I always came to work in my little suit and tie from uh, BFO. And I, I uh, always got a, a nice deal on the suit. And um, in fact, uh, Paul Simon, you know, Simon's menswear. Uh, any, anybody outside of, yeah, he's uh, Paul Simon went to Syracuse. Good friend of mine. Anyway. So I would come dressed in my shirt and tie and my jacket. And one day we had a blizzard. It was February of 1983. We had a blizzard that paralyzed the Northeast. And they realized that the, that the weather was the top story. And they couldn't just have the anchors read the weather. They needed a weather person to deliver the weather cast. And they turned to me, who was dressed for the part, and who wrote the weather cast every day. They said, can you do it? And um, I, shaking in my shoes, I said, sure, I'll do it called my folks and I'm going to be on tonight. And I, uh, I, I did the, the weather forecast. And if you don't know, when you watch your local news, weather is ad libbed, you know, they, 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 they have the, the map and they, they have all that, you know, let's watch the maps move and they've got all the, uh, the technical stuff, but, but that is um, it's all ad libbed around. It's not scripted, but I didn't know that it was my first time ever on the air getting paid for it. You know, I'd done some stuff at Syracuse, but that was just for class. So I scripted the whole darn weather cast and I looked like a deer in headlights saying, and the snow will stop a little later tonight and it should clear out by morning and we will have continued cold. It was, it was embarrassingly bad. My wife still shows it to me. If I start smelling myself a little bit, she'll say, come here, look at this. You're not take the garbage out. You're not so special. Remember that. And so I, I, I did uh, at the end of the show, they put me out in the snow and I had a hat of snow on my head. That's how bad it was snowing. They stuck a camera out the front door of the station and I, I did a little ad lib thing. And um, so then they decided that they were going to put weather in the uh, 
in the newscast and I was going to be the full-time weatherman. I mean, you know what that means to a kid. So, uh, so I started to do weather. I did weather for a while and, um, it was fine. It was okay. But I'd, I'd see people I hadn't seen in ages. And the first thing they would see, I hadn't seen them in years, you know, you ruined my weekend. So, uh, after a while, I thought, you know what? I, I don't know about weather. So then they fired the number one sports guy at New Jersey Network, which still exists, by the way. It's now called New Jersey Public Broadcasting. They fired the number one sports guy. They made the number two sports guy, the number one sports guy. And they came to me and said, we're thinking of whacking the weather. How'd you like to be the backup sports guy? And I looked my boss in the eye. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm a starting weatherman. I'm I'm part of the starting four. I'm on a set with everybody. I'm not going to be a backup anybody. I'm not doing it. I'll stick with weather. I went home. I was living at home. Weatherman living at home with his parents. Mom, where's my map? Um, where's my little stick to point out the... And um, I told my parents, I said, uh, you know, they offered me the backup sports job. I told them to stick it. What do you think? They said, you're a schmuck. Are you kidding me? That's all you've ever wanted to do your entire life is be a sportscaster. Now they're giving you the chance to be a sportscaster. You're right between New York and Philadelphia, and you're going to tell them no. So I went back the next day with my with my uh, helmet in hand, David, and I, I said, "Can I change my mind, please?" And um, they, they let me. And that was like October, around October '86, when the Mets beat the uh, Red Sox. Sorry again, David. And uh, it, would not, it was not long after that, uh, February of 87, that I, um, I went down to Philadelphia. I got a gig at KYW-TV in Philadelphia. And um, it, was, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I was re reporting on the Sixers, the Flyers, the Eagles, the Phillies, and, and uh, great college basketball in Philadelphia. With, uh, with Temple and, and Penn and, and all the great schools there, LaSalle and the big five schools. I was going to the Palestra. So that was, it was amazing. And uh, I did that for five years and, and then um, did not get my contract re renewed, as happens. And I had just met my, my wife and um, we moved to Boston. I got a job in Boston, as David said, at WLVI TV, Channel 56 which I don't even know if it, it, it does not exist anymore, at least in physical form on the same spot. It was at 75 Morrissey Boulevard, right next to the Boston Globe, across from UMass Boston. And they gave me a job. I was a sports director there. And that was unbelievable. I remember the, the, the first weekend, the Sox were out of town and I drove right down Yawkey Way and I drove to Fenway Park. And there was an old guy, his name's, he must be gone now. His name's, either that or he's 140. Uh, his name was Bob. And he was sitting on a wood chair in that garage door that opens out onto y Yawkey Way. And I said, uh, hey, I'm new in town. And I, I, I just, is it okay if I, if I go in real quick with my wife and we take a look at the, at the park? And he's like, yes, yeah, no, I care, sure. So I walked in and I saw the wall and I, the, all that green and the seats. And oh my God, I, I almost started to weep. It was, it was just unbelievable just to, to be in Boston. And I would do... During the, during the baseball season, I would actually do the sports cast from Fenway. And then during, during hockey and basketball, I would do them from the garden. And, and again, another blessing to me is to be able to say that I, I reported. In fact, my first week on the job, Larry Bird retired. My first week on the job. And you talk about panic. Um, and I'd never, I'd seen Larry Bird play in Philadelphia when I was working at KYW TV in Philadelphia, but I'd never seen him play on the parquet and that was that was like crushing so he'd come back from the olympics and he never played again for the celtics and i had to cover that i had to cover his retirement i had to cover this big huge ceremony that they had at the garden and and uh, i obviously knew about his career but when you're faced with that the first week on the job my goodness um so so i did that uh, i i covered the patriots they went to the super bowl in uh, 97, 96 season, 97 Super Bowl with Bill Parcells coaching him. And, and uh, it, was, it was awesome. And, and uh, we, we just absolutely loved Boston. And uh, as I told Dave earlier today, I really thought we were going to spend the rest of our lives there. But as fate would have it, my friends who, who I worked with at Channel 3, they gave me a call and said, hey, we're putting a band back together. You know what I mean? If you want to come back. And so my wife's from Philadelphia. She's from a suburb 
uh, Philadelphia called Havertown. And um, so I said, what do you think, dear? She said, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm out of this decision. Uh, we go back to Philadelphia. It goes bad. You blame me for the rest of our lives. It's not happening. She's a smart woman, my wife. So she said, I'll support you, whatever you want to do. But I, I'm, you know, I mean, I think you kind of know. But so one day we were staying in Boston. The next day we were going to Philadelphia. And obviously we went, to, went back to Philadelphia. And um, it was just the best decision I ever could have made with, with my career. Um, you know, my folks were, were still alive then. They were living in central Jersey. My in-laws were living right nearby. Our daughter was, had been born in Boston. Emily, who I told you about, also graduated from Syracuse. And we, uh, we came back to Philadelphia. And, and as soon as we were on the first night on, on the air, October 1st, 1997, it was, it was a Flyers, Carolina Panthers, a Carolina Hurricanes game. And, and um, it, I, I just thought this was the right move. And, and so, you know, Philadelphia, uh, unfortunately, sports-wise, is different than Boston or New York. My father-in-law would, because I grew up a New York sports fan, which I really don't say publicly much in Philadelphia, because they hate New York sports and New Yorkers as much as Bostonians do, and, and the rest of the world, for that matter. Um, but I was, I was a, a, you know, a big-time New York fan when I was growing up, and, and moving back to, to uh, moving to Philadelphia again, um, it, w it was just great to, to be able to have my, my folks nearby, my in-laws nearby, and, and to be able to really get going on my career. Um, and just the, the events that I got to cover, as my father-in-law would say, hey, in New York, you got nine teams. Are you kidding me? We got four teams. Pick a team, for goodness sakes, and stick with a team. We don't have the Rangers and the Islanders and the Jets and the Giants and the Mets and the Yankees. We got one. We got the Phillies. That's it. We got the Sixers, we got the Flyers, and we've got the Eagles. That's all. And let me tell you, none of those teams win too much. You know what I'm saying? So if you're if you're in New York or if you're in uh, uh, Toronto like Rick is or in Boston, um, you, you've seen your fair share of winning. And it's just not like that in Philadelphia. I said to my father-in-law recently, you know, the Phillies have been around since 1883. And I remember years ago when they hit 10,000 losses, which is what happens when you're not very good and you've been around since 1883, you hit 10,000 losses. And, and I said, I don't know how you did it. I don't know how any sports fan growing up in Philadelphia, I don't know how you did it. You had Wilt, then there was the Wilderness. Then you had 1983 with Dr. J. And that's the last time the Sixers won. You had the Flyers. They were the team, the, mo the most quickly expansion team to win a Stanley Cup. That was 73, 74, 74, 75. And then poof. That's gone. They haven't seen a title. They haven't seen a Stanley Cup, Rick, since then. And, and then you had the Eagles. They won in 1960. Never won a Super Bowl. Finally, they got one in 2018, which was was heaven on earth, as you might imagine, just like when the Sox broke the, the jinx of the curse of the Bambino. Um, but now you've had your share. And we thought in Philadelphia and the all the Experts around the country thought, well, the Eagles now, you know, they're going to be going back year after year. They've got that kind of organization. Well, it hasn't happened. And um, so that um, that has been a frustration, to be sure, because it, it, as much as I love my job and I love what I do, which I do, um, part of it has to do with the success or failure of the teams. And when the teams are failing, it really is not a lot of fun. I mean, when the teams are failing all the time, the Flyers start have started out good the Sixers you know probably about Ben Simmons and the fact that he wants out there's a whole big drama going on with Ben Simmons and the Sixers um the uh the Eagles nobody knows they're two and four right now they, they've got a coach that seems to not know what he's doing right now a quarterback who might not be the quarterback of the future he's probably not um and, and the Phillies have Bryce Harper and a bunch of guys named Joe so you know uh, it's, it's, it's really been, it's really been difficult in Philadelphia. Um, let me back up for a second and say concurrently with my time in Boston and also back in Philadelphia, I also did work as Dave mentioned for CBS sports and for USA network and for USA network, I did 18 U S open tennis championships in New York and in, uh, in Queens, um, starting in 1991 and ending in 2008, which was unbelievable to be able to do that. And I did three Olympic winter games for CBS. And that's when I also did the final four, the national championship football game for them. And, and that was, that was just great. It was, it was 
especially the Olympics, which were in Nagano, Japan, and Lillehammer, Norway, and uh, in Albertville, France. And to see the world like that, to be able to to be able to do that as part of your job, was um, was amazing. And just stories and memories for a lifetime, as you might imagine. So I, I have hosted, depending on what time frame we're talking about, I I have hosted the Sixers, Phillies, Eagles, and Flyers pregame and postgame programs. I also hosted a, a roundtable show called Daily News Live, which was a partnership with the Philadelphia Daily News, and um, which, which is no more. They, they whacked it a couple of years back. And, um, and on Twitter, people were saying with this whole Ben Simmons thing with the Eagles and all of Michigas that's going on, they were saying, I can say Michigan. You can't say Michigas to a Gentile audience. You know what I'm saying? But you can say it to, when you're working here. Um, but, but with all the Michigas going on, with uh, with the Eagles and everything, uh, I've been getting tweets on Twitter saying, "Wouldn't it be nice to have Daily News Live back to talk about all this stuff?" But unfortunately, it's uh, it's by the boards. So I would do the the pregame and the postgame, and that was, you know, three to five nights a week. And then when we hit the playoffs, I would do all every single game that the the uh, team in question was playing. Um, and then a couple of years ago, they wanted to streamline it, so then I started doing all the Phillies games and all the Eagles games, and then I do an occasional uh, Sixers and, uh, and Flyers game. In fact, I'm doing some Sixers games coming up, and, uh, and maybe that, that drama with Ben Simmons will, will still be going on because I, I want my say. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's really up to date with, with my career, how I got here, and, and um, it, it's, been, it's gone so fast, and it's been such a joy to do other than the failure of the teams. But um, it's still it's a it's a, like Boston, like New York. It's a gritty town, Philadelphia, and um, we're steadfast about our teams. But I think most of us are resigned that there are not going to be a lot of championships now, Mike. It's a, it's really just going to be about the games and cheering the teams on. I used to ask my father-in-law, "What would you what would you rather have? Would you rather have a championship with ten years in the wilderness?" and 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 no championship and no shot and finishing last or would you rather have like get to the playoffs be competitive and leaving the fans saying well you never know maybe you might make the playoffs uh, you might make the the championship round and um i'd take the championship every time every time so and i look back at 2008 with the phillies and i look back at um at 2018 with the Eagles, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. The memories from, from that was just incredible. Um, in fact, uh, I'm going to try to show you. I, I have some show and tell here if I could do it. Rick, you, let me know if I'm, I'm doing the, the wrong. You, you got my uh, photo? You see him? Good. Thumbs up. Yes. Okay. So this photo right here. Um, wait, can I, can I go to the, I can. Okay, so th this is the original crew from from uh, it was then called Comcast Sportsnet. Now it's called uh, NBC Sports Philadelphia. That's who we started with. There I am with the red and black tie in the back. Look a lot different than I did now. That was 1997 when we started up. And then um, a, a great moment was this is 2008, October 29th, 2008. That's Chase Utley. He was 29 years old at the time. Now he's in his mid 40s after the Phillies had won the World Series in 2008. That's at Citizens Bank Park in South Philadelphia. And that was an unbelievable. That's the other thing that's so great about sports is, is the memories that it brings, that uh, the, the generations that, that uh, sports brings together. And as, as it was in Boston when the Red Sox finally won, um, people wept be, for, because they were finally able to see it. They wept for people who were unable to see it or were no longer there. And it was the same thing in Philadelphia. Um, this is uh, Dan Jansen. You may uh, have heard of him. He is a gold medal winning speed skater. That's in Davos, Switzerland. And uh, that was, uh, I, I did a, an event called the, to, called Winterfest for CBS Sports. And uh, that's at a little pub just off the ice. And they would flood a soccer field. And the temperature got so cold in the winter, they didn't have, they didn't need any refrigeration system. They would just flood it and, and Zambonis would, would groom it. And then they would do speed skating races. So that was over there. That's also the Olympics. On the left is Christy Yamaguchi. 
And I don't know, I, I don't recall the, the woman on the right. I think she was a short track speed skater. This is, a, we, um, we do some of our Eagles pregame programs at a place called Xfinity Live. It's right in the shadow of, of Lincoln Financial Field. And that is former Eagles running back, went to Villanova University, Brian Westbrook, who, who is in the Eagles Hall of Fame. And he was one of our analysts. And you can see behind us that the, the fans get nutso uh, waiting for an Eagles game. And uh, I'm sure they were good and tanked up behind us. Um, this is um, a pregame show, for, uh, Flyers pregame. On the right, Brian Boucher is now with NBC. Yeah, I think he still is with NBC Sports. He does Flyers games. Bill Clement, the great fly, two-time Stanley Cup champion. You can see the ring on his finger. Um, and he has done many, many national games. He's worked for NBC, for ESPN. And um, he is he is one of the greatest analysts, I think, in, in uh, North American sports history. He's just amazing. So sharp, so prepared, so smooth. Uh, and then next to him is Al Morgani, the pride of Charlestown, Massachusetts, who uh, went to Boston University. He worked for ESPN for a while. And that was our, our analyst team. This is my family. Uh, I think it was my might have been my daughter's birthday. And uh, my my uh, on the right is my father in law. Next to next to him is my mother in law. Um, my mom. I'm sorry. She passed away in May. Below my mom is my mother-in-law, then my wife and my daughter with her arms around my wife, my daughter, Emily, my wife, Ellen, and my son, Matthew, who's a senior in college now. So that was uh, that was in 2014. That photo was taken. Anybody know who this is? This is the great hockey hall of famer, Bernard, Marcel, Parent, Bernie Parent. And this was taken in 1987. This was my first year. Remember I told you about going from New Jersey Network to KYW-TV. This was my first major assignment for Channel 3, which was covering the Flyers and Wayne Gretzky's Edmonton Oilers in the Stanley Cup final. And no one thought the Flyers had a chance. And it turned out they didn't, but they pushed the Oilers to uh, game seven. And they lost game seven, three to one after scoring the first goal. Murray Craven scored it. And um, Ed Snyder, the late, great owner of the Philadelphia Flyers brought the, the um, champions out, uh, including Bill Clement, who you saw before and Bernie Perrant, who, who uh, was, is one of the greatest goaltenders to ever play the game. Um, and uh, so I got the opportunity to, uh, to interview Bernie. We're still, we're still friends to this day. He's just an unbelievable guy. Uh, this is just messing around in the newsroom. I had a little selfie stick and I was using it. The guy in the middle is Jimmy Lynham. Played for West Catholic, St. Joseph's University, coached the Sixers, general managed the Washington um, um, Wizards for a time. And there's John Clark, who's a buddy of ours. He's on NBC 10. And that's the same. There's Al on the right and just some friends in the newsroom. There's the Philly fanatic. And then on the right is Ike Reese, who um, played for the Philadelphia Eagles. He was a pro bowler with the Eagles. And he and I forgot to tell you about that. That's why I'm doing this uh, show and tell. I did radio for five years as well in Philadelphia. We called it the Mike and Ike show. And um, I did that from 2011 through 2016. And this is down in spring training covering the Phillies. We go down for a couple of days in, uh, well, that's, you can see it up there. Spectrum Field, Clearwater, March 16th. Uh, it's Ike and I again at a charity golf outing. Uh, this is another charity golf outing. Uh, on the far left is Ike. Next to him is Ray Dittinger, who is a Hall of Fame writer for the Philadelphia Bulletin, Philadelphia Daily News, and uh, was a producer for NFL Films and also continues to be one of our analysts um, for, um, for our Eagles pregame show. Next to him in the black shirt is Brett Brown, who was a six, former Sixers uh, head coach. He's also from, uh, he's from Maine. He's one of the greatest athletes ever to uh, come out of Maine, went to BU, and just a great guy. Uh, it's my son, Matt. He was hell of a golfer. And I, I stuck that in there. That's Merrill Reese in the blue shirt, who is the radio voice of the Philadelphia Eagles, has been doing it for probably going on 50 years. And we had a radio broadcast in the booth during a, an Eagles practice at Lincoln Financial Field. So Merrill joined us in the booth. That's the family up at Syracuse. Uh, it was Emily's first day. We were dropping her off. That's the SI Newhouse School of Public Communications. That's the plaza there. And um, um Man, was I proud that she got in and that, and that uh, she had a great academic career. That's at the Carrier Dome. That game they played LSU, 
and Leonard Fournette, who who had an um, who was a beast against the Eagles. Less was it last week they played Tampa Bay? He just killed them. We watched him kill the Orange Men, uh, or the Orange. Now they're they're called at the Dome. Um, that was Emily's freshman year. Here's the U.S. Open. There's Alec Baldwin right there, and then next to him is Monica Selich. Um, and then behind them with with um, her head turned in the blonde hair is Tracy Austin, who is also a two-time U.S. Open uh, champion. And you ready for this? See above my head, there's a woman with dark hair. She's turned looking over in the distance. She became my boss and was my boss for about 12 years at NBC Sports Philadelphia, Michelle Murray. And we're still in touch, but she no longer works for us. That's Julius, the doctor, Irving in the studio. Remember when he punched out Larry Bird, Dave? Do you remember that? It was a be- that was not nice. It was not fair. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, he said he said quite a quite a life, Julius, and um, he's always been great to me. That's that's on the set of Daily News Live, which I had told you about. That was the roundtable discussion show that we did. Uh, this, the man on the left is my is my dad, my late dad. Uh, he passed away in 2008. Also went to Syracuse. Then me on the right. That's a tavern on the green in Manhattan, in New York. And in the center is uh, one of the great uh, athletes in American history. Never mind Jewish athletes. That's Marty Glickman. And Marty Glickman had, was the voice of the Knicks, the voice of the Rangers, the voice of the Giants, the voice of the Jets, and and uh, United States Olympian in the 36 games. And um, if you if you know your uh, oh, I, I see the Mark Howe, uh, photo there, Rick. Very nice, very nice. Um, but Marty Glickman, uh, I don't know if you know the, know his story, but as a, an 18 year old out of Syracuse, and he was from New York, but he went to Syracuse. He made the United States Olympic track and field team that was going to compete in Berlin, Germany, in in Hitler's Olympics, and. Uh, he and Sam shoot, I should know his last name, uh, who was another Jewish runner. They, uh, uh, Avery Brundage, who was then the USOC head and that became the IOC head. And it was one of the worst guys to ever, uh, uh, involve himself in sport. He was an evil man. Um, at the behest of Adolf Hitler, uh, Marty and Sam did not run. Yeah. Now, Marty, Marty might not have beaten Jesse Owens in the 100 meters, yeah. but he would have meddled. Um, he, he would have meddled. And um, he later went back to Berlin as a as a as a middle aged man, might have been even a little older than that. And, and um, you know, obviously the emotions flowed and he was just so angry at, at what the what the Nazis and, and what Hitler did to him. Um, but what a career he had both in sport. And he also played football at Syracuse. He was a, he was a wide receiver, uh, and a tailback. And he was, he was blistering fast as you can imagine, Marty Glickman. What a, what a great man. And that's, that's one of, that's one of the, my, my favorite photos. Um, this is the crew down in, in, uh, in Clearwater. We were just having some laughs in sp- during spring training. And uh, that's, that's part of the fun. You work like dogs, but then you go out and you have a little, uh, have a little dinner and have a little libation, which is nice. Um, that's an in- interview. Um, shoot. It's the former Phillies manager. He was their coach, but he was, he was only manager for, for a season. And, uh, he, he, uh, he did a nice job, but as the Phillies always do, they let go of guys be- when they shouldn't and keep guys when they should. Um, on the right is Ike Reese again, my partner in the radio in radio and in the center, is um, uh, current Eagles football operations head, Howie Roseman. And um, uh, if you call me, I'll tell you more about what I think about Howie. He is a nice Hebrew boy, though, Howie Roseman. I in, in fact, I inducted him into the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Uh, my family and I have a charity. It's called the Barkan uh, Family Healing Hearts Foundation. And we have a, uh, a golf outing every single year. And um, uh, let me do, we'll do this with the cursor. That's Barrett Brooks. Uh, former Eagles tackle. There's Brian Boucher mentioned him before Mark Zumoff, who is the former play-by-play television voice of the Sixers. He just retired Two former Sixers head coaches and Brett Brown and Jimmy Lynham. There's D Lynham who is um, Jimmy's daughter and also worked with us. Uh, Tommy Green, former Phillies pitcher. Uh, there's Al Morgani again, John Nash, who is former Sixers general manager. This is Milt Thompson, who's the for- a former Phillies outfielder. And there's Merrill Reese again. Uh, at our uh, golf outing, which which we have every year, it's Ellen. That's my wife, Ellen. 
we've been married um, next year, for goodness sakes. My gosh, it'll be 30 years we've been, we've been married. That's us in Hawaii. You can't get enough of the Barkham family, you know, photos, right? I'm, I threw those in. That's a Kapalua. I don't know if any of you golfer, golfers out there. I got I got Matt and my, my son is an excellent golfer. I wish he had pay, played in college. Um, but where he goes to college um, on the golf team is Bernard Longer's son, you know. Uh, so so it's kind of tough to make it, but we had fun there. That's my sister and my niece. Um, this is us filming. That's Derek Gunn. He used to be our Eagles uh, sideline guy. And we were filming a promo for for our Eagles pregame and postgame coverage. And we had cameras in the car. And that was, there's Barrett again. There's Ray on the left. Ray also authored a play called Tommy and Me about the late, great Tommy McDonald who is a, a, an Eagles, a former Eagles wide receiver and a Hall of Famer. And, and uh, so we were messing around with this. This is the crew. We were in Clearwater doing a, a, a big special before an Eagles season. That's uh, Pro Football Hall of Famer Brian Dawkins. And he came out to help us out with our charity. And um, he's, uh, he's, he's a great guy. He hit like a ton of bricks, let me tell you. Um, this right here is Ryan Howard. Uh, former Phillies first baseman, borderline Hall of Famer, has the Phillies record for home runs hit 58 in a season and uh, and a world champion in 2008 and a pennant winner in 2009. Um, that's my family up at school at Syracuse. This is the aftermath of the Eagles Super Bowl victory, Dave Kravitz. And um, uh, on the left, me, then Barrett Brooks, and there's Ray, and there's uh, Seth Joyner who is also a, a champion. He, he's got a ring with Denver, um, but he was a longtime Eagles linebacker, and, and Seth is in the Eagles Hall of Fame as well. And then on the right is the former governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the Honorable Edward G. Rendell, also the former mayor of Philadelphia, and the Gov, as I call him. Um, he, he joined us every, uh, every week. He was, he was an analyst on the show, and... and uh, Man, did he have his uh, opinions and views. There's Ray. That's on the cover of Ray's book. It just came out. I took that after the Eagles won. And, and during the post-game show, uh, Ray said to me, he said, he's very mild-mannered. He said, Mike, are we going to take a commercial break soon? And I said, why, Ray? Do you need to use the restroom? He said, no, I, I'd like to give my son a hug. And his son, David, shot the game for NFL Films. And Ray's dad had owned a tavern in Philadelphia and he had a block of Eagles tickets going way back. And the Eagles started in 1933. And, and um, so I said, well, hold on right there. I said, David, come here. I know David too, obviously. And David came in and the two of them had had a hug on the air and, and shed tears. And Ray said, this is for pop. Um, and, and even though he, he likes to be objective, he couldn't be at that moment. That's the parade behind us is uh is the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the famed Rocky Steps and the Rocky statue is see where the cursor is. If you go down, actually down on the ground to the right at the base of those steps. But that is a beautiful, just like the, the, uh, the museums of art in, in uh, the cities around the country and, and uh, in Canada, certainly is just a one of a kind, great world class uh, museum of art. So that was the parade that's covering a Sixers game. There's Jimmy Lineham again. Uh, there's uh, Mark Jackson, who's a former Temple player and former Sixer, a former Golden State Warrior. He, and the, the two of them are our Sixers analysts. That was before a playoff game. And uh, on our shoulders there is Scott O'Neill, who was then president of the Sixers. We were just getting ready to do a pregame show. Another golf outing. Let me see if there's anyone on the left. This is Mickey Morandini, former Philly second baseman. Um, and uh, Dickie Knowles, former Phillies pitcher. Now, this story, this man right here, Dickie Knowles, 1980, game number, I think it was game number four of the World Series, Phillies against the Kansas City Royals, and Dickie Knowles at Kansas City dusts George Brett, throws, not really throws at his head, but throw, threw at close enough at George Brett that he hit the deck, and many credit that pitch as sending the Phillies over the top and, and winning the World Series. This guy right here, Ricky Paul Batalico, and he's a former all-star pitcher for the Phillies. 
and he is my partner every single night for Phillies pregame and postgame, and he is a nut, and he's a, a great guy. If you saw the movie Invincible about Vince Papali, uh, this is Vince right here, longtime friend. Daughter also went to Syracuse. There's Barrett Brooks again right here. Jeremiah Trotter, former Eagles linebacker. Uh, again, Barkham Family Healing Hearts Foundation is what we do. This, remember, I saw I, I showed you the photo of Chase Utley um, interviewing him after the World Series. This is Chase Utley coming back to Philadelphia as a Dodger. We took a walk around Citizens Bank Park and and just talked about yesteryear. It was it was uh, it was special. There's Chase now retired one of the greatest second basemen to ever play. If he weren't injured as much as he was, um, he would be a, he'd be a lock hall of famer, but uh, I, I don't think he's going in um, Super Bowl trophy. And um, you know, still, still incredible that, that the, that the Eagles got one. That's Ben Davis, former number two overall draft pick in 1995 at the San Diego Padres. And we would do our pregame programs from out in left field, left center field, at Citizens Bank Park. Isn't this fun gig? I mean, I'm thinking about this. Is this great? I see Dave Dave uh, nodding. Let me tell you, to be able to do this uh, and be able to show it to you is is really special for me. It's, it's you know, I, I, get, I get to do this um, not infrequently, and, and every time I go through photos like this, it's just, I, I get to do this? It's unbelievable. This is the post -game, pre game and post-game crew. After the last game of the season, there's Ricky again, a uh, couple of beers into it. And um, we always go over across to the ballpark and hoist a few and celebrate the season, which usually is long and insufferable. Um, again, you can't get enough of the Super Bowl trophy. I'm sorry. Uh, that's at Xfinity Live. You can see the, the uh, Lincoln Financial Field right here. It's a beautiful setting. And uh, unless it's minus 10 when they make us go out there, you can't feel your jaw. But um, um, we haven't done that in, in a while. But it was pretty cool. This was the season after the Super Bowl, and we're doing the pregame show. This is anybody. This is the Palestra on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania, and this is where all the games were played uh, back in the day. And I'm talking about Villanova. Uh, Drexel uh, came in later. They now call it the City Six instead of the Big Five. Villanova, Temple, Penn, LaSalle. St. Joseph's, and they comprise the Big Five and all their games against each other. Well, actually, any game was played there, and it's on Penn's campus, and that is what you call a gym. And when you see a game in there, especially in February, you got your coat on your lap because you can't uh, – there's just no place to put anything. This thing was built in like 19 uh, – I think, I think 1933, same year as the Eagles came in, the Palestra, named after the Palestrum of the ancient Greeks. Uh, that's Emily. It's my daughter on the left up at Syracuse doing her thing. This is, uh, I don't know if you, you uh, actually the, the Flyers played the Bruins up uh, at Fenway for one of these games. This is a stadium series game at Lincoln Financial Field, February of 2019. There's Al Morgani again. This is Chris Terrian, who was a former Flyer at one time, was the longest tenured athlete in Philadelphia. And he was our Flyers analyst for a while. So we, we were doing a, pregame show for the game uh, Jim Salisbury uh, the pride of uh, Kingston Rhode Island and he um, he's our um, our Phillies insider for NBC Sports Philadelphia.com we were doing a special going into the Phillies season the first season with Bryce Harper that's outside the ballpark in Clearwater uh, that's our set and this this set for for Phillies it looks like that for for Eagles you um, when you saw me before uh, that's what it looks like for Eagles games. So it gives us the ability to to um, to switch signage and and to stay in the same studio. And by the way, this is Jimmy Rollins, also a borderline Hall of Famer. Don't know if he's going to make it with Ricky. Uh, this was opening day of 2019. Uh, that's Ellen. We brought Raven in. That's Raven. She she did a special segment. It was rough. <laughs> uh, and then we got the heck out of there. That's also on, on our new set. That's my mom. She passed in May. I think I mentioned 90 years of age, former, former Syracuse uh, alum and with Emily and, and myself on uh, graduation day. That's at Newhouse at Syracuse. Uh, this I'm sure you know where this is, right? Uh, um, in, in Israel, that's, that's Matt. That's my son. Uh, that's a top Masada 
at uh, at sunrise. How about that? Is that awesome? Uh, he had a blast. He was on birthright. Both my kids went on birthright within like a week of each other. Um, that's Ben Davis again at the ballpark. About to do a pregame show. Oh, this is something. I'm, this is Hard Knocks. I don't know if you ever watch Hard Knocks on HBO, but it's one of my favorite shows. And right here, if you see the cursor, see where it says Emily Barkan, associate producer right there. She worked on Hard Knocks. And, and so I'm watching at home. And there's my daughter on the, on the credit roll, which was really cool. So all that money went for something. You know what I mean? Um, Matt played, um, uh, played sprint football for a season at Penn. So we went out there at Franklin Field. And uh, it's my in-laws. And there's Emmy. And we, we cheered him on. He was, a, he was a cornerback, and the, then they wanted to convert him to wide receiver, and then the pandemic happened, and he's like, you know what? Uh, there's other things I'd rather do than get hit in the mouth playing football. Uh, another uh, postseason um, a gathering. Uh, that's, that's Matt, 28, on the sideline there. There he is after a game. Um, this guy right here is one of, the, uh, one of the best players in the sprint football division, um, uh, uh, certainly at Penn and his name's Laquan McKeever. And during the pandemic, he actually lived with us in the basement because he, he, um, he didn't want to go home. Uh, everything was being done remotely and he was, he was just awesome. Uh, we're still in touch and he and Matt are fraternity brothers. Uh, it's just a little golfing date. Oh, this was great. The, the, uh, remember Gabe Kapler now managing the, uh, giants, well, we were all out for our postseason golf outing. There's Ben up here. There's Ricky. There's all the guys who work on the show. Amy Fadul also hosts. These two are married, by the way. Sean is our producer for pre and post. So we're out on the golf course, and we get the call that the Phillies have fired Gabe Kapler. We all had to leave. We were about four holes in. Well, it was fun while it lasted. There's Matt. Play. This is Ben. Is Benji cute? Huh? That's that's um. Emily's boyfriend, Joe, came to uh, Ellen and me right about the time she was ready to graduate, said, I'd like to get Emily a dog for graduation. We already have a dog, and we were thinking about uh, maybe getting another one. And when he said, uh, we, would, would you mind? And uh, we said, no, and that's Benji. So there he is. He is adorable. No, we don't have a boat, uh, but this was a great photo. That's Ellen. That was fun. It's, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. There's Matt and his fraternity brothers. Um this guy right here, I know his dad. This this was at um, Book of Mormon. And, and um, I work for his father, and he was in the cast of Book of Mormon. Uh, that's the, Remember, you saw, you saw the Phillies uh, pregame signage? They just switched the whole thing to Eagles. And uh, it was uh, November, hence the beard was Movember. So I tried a little beard action. Uh, oh, this you might find interesting. This is our study. This is our den. And during the pandemic, we had to go live. We were not allowed in the office. We were not allowed in the studio. So I've got my phone right here shooting me. I've got an iPad right here uh, so I can see what we call the return video. So I know what's going on in the air. All this stuff's plugged in. I got another iPad so I know so I can communicate with the producer. This thing's running really hot. Uh, let me tell you, I've got a ring light right here to light me up. And this is Charles Barkley's uh, sneaker right, right there. Um, so, and, and we literally worked like that for um, the start of the pandemic when we were quarantining at what, what was that? Like the middle of March until the end of July when baseball started up, uh, July of 2020, when we went back in. Uh, and this is what it would look like, what the viewer would see at home. There I am in the study. Um, there's Derek Gunn, there's Barrett Brooks, and we're doing a show. Boom. That was my 60th birthday in quarantine. Uh, and and uh, there's there's Ellen right here and Emily and Matt. And this is Emily's boyfriend, Joe. There's Laquan. And I put my tux, tux on. I figured, you know, uh, if I'm going to spend my, the 60th in uh, in quarantine, I might as well do it up. So we had we had a, a great night. Unfortunately, my family, the rest of my family couldn't be around, but we, we still had fun anyway. And oh, this was. Uh, we, we were doing an interview is Steve Carlton lefty, as they call him. This is Tim McCarver, who was lefties, uh, was Carlton's exclusive catcher when he, when he pitched for the Phillies. And uh, you've probably heard him, seen him in the broadcast booth. And this is Mike Gaddy, our producer. And that's what we would essentially be doing. I think this was a zoom interview, just like we're doing now. Uh, Emily won uh, an Emmy. There it is right there. I've got a couple of myself, but she's got a 
pardon my French, a big ass Emmy. This is, these are little ones. This is a national Emmy that she won for NFL films, um, producing hard knocks and, and doing some of the 100th anniversary of the NFL. This right here is when I was doing the world league of American football on USA network. I was always doing something nutty. So someone sent this to me uh, who was writing a book on the, the world league. And I, I thought I'd put that in there for you. We would travel. We called it the best TV. No one saw we had the, we had the Monday night football production crew doing this thing. And it just never took, this is not the XFL by the way, that, which was, which came later. Uh, this was the world league. This is 90, 91, 92. Uh, here's, this is, uh, this is my boss right now, but there's Mark Zumoff again, who just retired. And in fact, Kate Scott took his place. She becomes the second female NBA play-by-play -play announcer, and she called her first game last night, did a great job, Kate Scott. There's Brian Dawkins again. He just came out with a book, and I'm interviewing him. And then this is, I think this is the last shot. This is Emily's, she's, she's wearing her 25th birthday, where is my sister, Susan. And we're all out to dinner. There's Joe. We're all out to dinner. This, this was, uh, what's today? It was October 12th. So today's the 21st. So it was two, you know, a week and a half ago. And I think, oh, and this is golf the other day. There's Mark Jackson again. There's Jimmy Lynham, the former Sixers coach. And uh, we were at a charity outing for the, for the American Cancer Society. Uh, and that is the deal. Oh, my goodness. I'm out of breath. Uh, any questions? <laughs> There'll be an exam at the end. I hope it wasn't too boring for you, but I figured well, you're great. You're great. Great personality. <laughs> we loved it. Everyone yeah. loved it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have a few questions for you, actually. Sure. Shoot. So one of the questions I can ad lib the question, but I was basically do ad lib or what kind of prep like you did for the weather or, or do you do preparation for great your question. shows? Great question. I do both. Um, Sometimes I need to be the specific stories, which I will have. I don't have one here. I'll have a script for. And then we work with teleprompter, um, which is it's a special setup with with mirrors, one one way mirrors. So which co goes over the camera lens and you can see writing on it like you like you'd be able to advance your your computer uh, copy. And um, and it looks like you're looking into the camera, but you're really reading the text. Uh, but mostly I do ad lib, uh, the pregame show I'll, I'll ad lib after, um, after I've r read the scripted open. Um, but the postgame show I ad lib, boom, we come on the air. Our little tagline is we're on when the clock hits zero for Eagles clock hits zero. We started up, we don't have the game and we get great. We get a great audience cause we've been doing it for so long and I'm ad libbing that all the way. Most, I would say most of what I do is ad lib. All right, um, I'm going to uh, remove your spotlight. Okay. So we can, uh, so where we can put you back into a, uh, uh, hmm, I did, but you're still there, but okay. <laughs> Rick, why is he not going smaller? Um, remove, remove his spotlight. I did, but he's still there. Oh, Alan, to every I, I'm, I'm seeing some of them on the right. Um, I see Dave's name right there. Uh, it says, uh, what's Sixers owner Josh Harris like in person? Well, his, his, his son and my son, Matt, who you just saw photos of, they were on the sprint football team together. Josh Harris also went to Penn, multi-billionaire. I think he's one of the richest people in, in America. Um, He's, you know, he's like any other billionaire you would meet. Not, not really interested in hearing from little old you um, or little old me. And and uh, now he's got his hands full with this whole Ben Simmons thing. So um, he's a nice enough guy. And and uh, we, we we chat every every time we see each other at the games, but at the, at the sprint football games. Um, Jeff Lowenstein, what's up, buddy? Watched the Super Bowl once at his place. I remember that in Bishop's Forest in Waltham. I remember that. No, it wasn't Gary Varsho. It was uh, um, um, Dave McKinnon. I think Dave McKinnon. I could, I could look it up. Pete McKinnon. Pete McKinnon. 
Um, yes, it was. And he, I, I actually thought he did a pretty good job. And um, uh, what I always what I always say is that the most with regard to professional sports, you got to pick talent, you got to coach talent and you got to be talent. And, and of all those three positions, I mean, the talent's got to be talent. The players got to play. They got to be the, the players that you expect them to be. The coaching's got to coach them up. They got to be good. But the, in, in professional sports, when you're at the elite level of sport, the most number one position is the general manager position or the, or the op operations position. Because if you cannot properly assess the talent, if you don't know what you're looking at, um, or you're, you're making that, you know, which is one of the problems that has been with, with Howie Roseman. He like, likes to wheel and deal, and everyone's like, well, the Eagles have three first-round picks next year. That's great if you know what you're looking at. And that's all, all well and good. Um, do I miss doing radio? Uh, great question. I, I miss Ike. I miss, you know, I, I, I miss the people that I work with, but it was doing the Comcast Sportsnet stuff now, NBC Sports Philadelphia. Um, it was too much. And we were three hours. Ike and I were three hours. And most shows are four. And eventually they switched us to four. So I, had, I just had no downtime at all and at that point i was like you know what this is just this is just too much so but i do miss being with ike and we had we had some great laughs we're still friends we'll go out and have a cigar every now and then um what advice do you have for an aspiring sports broadcaster great question uh one learn how to write well i can't tell you the number of people i see coming out of college they can't write worth a damn and, and um you know before you can write for the ear, how it sounds, which is what you're doing when you're, when you're writing for, for whether, whether it's radio or television, you need, it's like before you can, you can do the behind the back pass, get the bounce pass and the chest pass down pat before you do any of that. So I would say, learn how to write well. You don't necessarily, I'm, I'm glad I majored in broadcast journalism because it, it showed me the, the kind of covering stories part of it, but you don't have to, if you have, a, have enough ambition, um, you, you can major in English, for goodness sakes. Uh, so although if you can go to a school like Syracuse or go to a school like Northwestern, the Medill School of Journalism, that's pretty good pedigree. Um, and it's, it's tough to get in those schools. I mean, I, there's no way I, I, would, get, I would get in <laughs> with my grades today or stay in for that matter. Um, Jeff Lowenstein, what's up, buddy? Good to see you again. During COVID, road team announcers didn't travel to visiting team arena stadium do you think that will become the norm in the future save money and make more convenient that is a great question um our our phillies crew and our sixers crew and our flyers crew did not travel i think that that is going to change with the uh, sixers and the flyers eventually depending on how the pandemic gets tamped down hopefully um but the production teams the director the producer, um, the technical director, they probably will not travel and that will save significant dollars. Uh, I don't know if it's the best thing for the telecast, but nobody asked me. So, so um, yeah, I, I, I think that eventually the announcers will go. So Tom McCarthy and, and Ben Davis or Ruben Amaro Jr., they will go. Um, and and uh, Kate Scott and Ala Abdelnabi, how about that? Al Abdelnami, former Celtic, former Sixer, um, and a former Duke Blue Devil. So uh, Tony from Churchville, PA, joining us. So why isn't GM Daryl Morey getting any heat for overplaying his hand and overestimating Ben Simmons' value? He should have traded him months ago after the Game 7 disaster. Now they'll get pennies on the dollar. Tony, that's a great point, uh, Tony and Gene. I don't know if he could have if he could have traded him then, though. Everybody saw that on national television. This guy, this former number one overall pick, have a dunk. Clip. Oh, he's going down for it. No, I'm going to pass the ball. No one could believe it. Why did he pass the ball? Because if he had gone for the dunk, he would have gotten fouled. He, he would have had to go to the free throw line, and he can't shoot free throws, never mind three-pointers. So, um, I mean, I started to hear it not long after that because the, the big name that everybody thought the Sixers could get was uh, was Dame Lillard uh, from Portland. And there was just no way that Portland was going to give him up for Ben Simmons. And, and really, where you make your money, I think you would agree, Tony, is in the playoffs. 
And in the regular season, Ben Simmons was scintillating. One, defense would alter a game. Unbelievable. Two, the way he handled the ball at his size, the way he could drive the lane. He could get you triple doubles, rack them up. But then in the playoffs, when the type of ball changed and it was more of a half-court game and, and he couldn't just you know run freely down the court as he would in the regular season, he had trouble with that. He he would he would run, he would dribble the ball, he'd get to the the three-point line and he'd pass it off every time. So you you kind of just took him right out of the off, offense right off the bat. If you were defending, you're like, you know, he ain't shooting the ball. And then they clog up the middle and he just was not was a non-issue. And then when he passed up the damn shot, are you kidding me? That was it. So so um I I think Daryl Morey probably did his best. I don't know if you I'm, I'm assuming. Tony being from Churchville, you heard what Maury said today. He was on 97.5, the fanatic in Philadelphia. He said, you people better do it, bat, meaning the fans, you better batten down the hatches. He said, this, this could go, this could go on for four years because he signed a five-year extension a year ago. He's making 33, $34 million on the average. And, and um, I think they docked him. I don't know if it was 8 million, but they docked him pay because he didn't come into training camp. And then they took his fines out of that. He, I mean, I don't know how much he cares, but if he doesn't play, he'll still be set for life. So, all right, Michael. So um, the hour is up. What? And yeah. But, but I have a question for you because yes. I'm a Jersey guy also. So really? we have a lot in common. My son is works for the Red Sox, and so we and and you lived in Philly, and you lived in Boston. And I grew up as a big New York Mets fan, a Knicks fan, just like you. Um, and I've switched allegiance. So be honest. Yes. Be really honest. Yes. Yeah, Who's the better fan, Philly or Boston? Well, they're, they're slightly yeah. different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Philly, is, Philly is a nastier fan, a down and dirty, grittier fan. Boston is kind of like more – for lack of a better description, more of a wholesome fan. I won't go like the, like they're not like Kansas city or Chicago and hey, great to see you, you know, or Minnesota, but, but, um, but Boston fans, I remember John Keller, who I don't, I don't know. He's where, still there. He's he's still, still, yeah. John Keller used to tell a story about he and his wife on a Sunday morning, they'd be reading the Glo Sunday globe and, it was at the age of son, his son was like eight, nine years old. And he was at the age when he was just starting to get, to get interested in sports. And he and his wife were reading the paper and this, this son, son looks at the standings and says, you know, the Sox might really have a chance this year. And he said, my wife and I, we put down our reading. We looked at each other and we, we pulled them close and we said, come here, sweetheart. You know, you can root for the Sox all you want. But remember one thing, they will never, ever win. Of course, he was wrong about that. It took, it took a while. Um, and, and I think, you know, that was the downtrodden Red Sox fan. And, and it, it's anything but now. The expectations are to, to be a champion. But I, I think, like I said, I, th I think Philadelphia fans, they're tough. They're the boo birds. They do boo. They boo. If they're not, if you're not giving them a, a day's work for a day's pay, um forget hang on i got a cough if you're not giving them a day's work for a day's pay forget it so, you can so i would uh, yeah i know it's called a cough switch cough button but but um yeah so i i would say philly has the edge i mean because look jd drew former red stock jd drew was drafted by the phillies and and his agent said don't draft him we're telling you he's he ain't gonna play for you and they drafted him anyway, and he sat out, and he didn't play, and he ended up getting a ring with the Sox. And when he came back to, to um, the vet and or Citizens Bank Park, they threw batteries at that dude, you know. Or if, if – that's uh, yeah, that's true. Or if you're a guy like Scott Rowland, who, who is a borderline Hall of Famer, if not a Hall of Famer, uh, one of the great third basements to ever play, if you're Scott Rowland and you, you make it clear, like, you know, Philadelphia is not for you, it's not your kind of town – you want to be in, in, you know, in Cincinnati, you want to be in the Midwest where it's not as intense or, or in St. Louis, um, which is baseball heaven, I think is what he called it. Uh, and get the heck out, you know, that's fine. We, we, then we, we'll, 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 we'll cheer without you, but, uh, or we'll boo you. But uh, Scott, uh, I think eventually if Scott Rowland came back, he hasn't been back to be honored in any way. 
because I think he would be honored. Uh, I think all would be forgiven with Scott Rowland. He was a great player. He just couldn't handle Philadelphia. And at that time, they were playing at the vet. And the vet turf was basically like playing on concrete. It really was. And so so his his back, he was a sizable guy. And he just couldn't take that. So, so great. <clears throat> we have more questions, but oh. it is uh, we are pa way past nine o'clock now. So uh, okay. we do have a question of server metrics taking over the game. Um, I guess we can stay on if you choose to after. But we're going to wrap up. Um, you were great. You were very entertaining. We loved all the family uh, pictures and and your whole life story. What but, Michael? But, what what I would week? ask? I'm on again next week, aren't I? Yeah, right? absolutely. Right? Mark sure. wants me on. Hey, listen, I we, I heard we, listen, we might have a, uh, we're, <laughs> you know, you never know when we might have a convention in Philadelphia and we call, we can call you uh, to join well, us. That'd so. be great. Uh, Dave was telling me that earlier today, and if, uh, I'd love to meet you all in person. That'd be great. With a mask, of course. You never know. Well, hopefully by then. But anyway, um, what I would ask is if you could send, you have David's email, if you could send David your uh, foundation information. And we certainly would make a contribution on behalf of Federation of Jewish Men's Club for because uh, we're paying you the big bucks to do this tonight, uh, which is what all of us get paid that that work for the organization. And uh, so it's the inside of a bagel, right? Um, so thank you, everyone. We do have a couple of um, events coming up. Our next one is Mr. Kravitz. This will be November 18th. We're going to have Peggy Shakar. She is the Deputy Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League. And Danny, talking about the one after. The yeah, so Michael, you're going to like the next one I'm about to tell you. So we're <laughs> very fortunate on December 2nd to have Dan Grunfeld, who just wrote a new, who just wrote a book, By the Grace of the Game, uh, The Holocaust a Basketball Legacy and an Unprecedented American Dream. So he is a former professional player, played in Israel professionally, and his uh, family are Holocaust survivors. And his book is actually coming out uh, two days before our webinar. And we were able to, uh, I'm actually talking to his agent tomorrow. So we were able to get him and that's gonna be uh, really unbelievable. So that's December 2nd at eight o'clock. So- uh, Can I make a suggestion for other guests? Sure. I don't, I don't know if you'll be able to get them and I don't know these people. Um, one is Ray Allen. Who, who oh, yeah. you know, you know his story with the Holocaust? No, no. Ray, Ray Allen, when uh, and I don't know what he's doing now. Do you he, know him? I do not know him. Oh. But but oh. he he when he was a player, he became uh, completely immersed in the Holocaust, and he would I don't want to say force his teammates every time they would go to D.C. He would take his teammates to the Holocaust Museum, and, and he is he's very knowledgeable about the Holocaust. And obviously uh, a Hall of Famer, just unbelievable guy. The other guy is Tamir Goodman. Familiar with Tamir Goodman? No, no, not only him. are we uh, familiar with him, we actually have him. We have You've him. met him no. on. We had yeah. him from yeah. Israel. From oh, Israel. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, from Israel. Awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was yeah. one of our, uh, man, you were great too. So don't, you know, yes, yeah, we did. We, uh, Phenomenal. we had Tamir, we had Tamir's coach. And uh -huh. we're trying to get who's the Yeshiva University guy. And I'm trying to get, some of his uh, protégés um, who might, you know, play Are you the game. Touch with him still? Yeah. Because he might. Uh, oh, how I about have his Amari? email, Tamir or Amari whatever. Stoudemire. Amari Stoudemire. I know we're working. That's we're the guy I wanted to get him. That bad. I couldn't get him. We're trying. We're trying. But we did have Tamir. He was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Uh, okay, so he woke me up once at two in the morning because you know he was <laughs> he was putting to fill it on. And yeah. he forgot I was in Boston, and he. But that's okay. He was great. All right. So. It's all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. Uh, everyone really so enjoyed much. it. And thank you, uh, again, right. please, please fun. send us your uh, foundation well, information. We happen to make a donation, and we'll see everyone really soon. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Great job, Mr. Kravitz. As great always, thank you, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Pleasure as thank always. You. Go Red thank Sox. You. Oh. Everyone pray for the Red Sox tomorrow. Pray night. for the Red Sox. Say a prayer. We will never hear the end of it. Say a prayer tomorrow yeah. for the Red Sox, please. But to be it, you can't watch it, you know, because it's Shabbat. But, you know, <laughs> we'll make it exception. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> if the TV is already on and he forgets to turn it off. Yeah, that could be a possibility. Azoi. Hey, hey, good to you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.